Hello and welcome to another YouTube InventRight show. My name is Andrew Krauss. I'm the co-founder. I co-founded InventRight 21 years ago with Stephen Key, and we've been coaching and mentoring inventors to license their products ever since. We have a great guest on today. His name is Jake Ward with Ward Law Offices. Welcome, Jake. Welcome, Andrew. Yeah, thanks hey. for having me. Yeah, and we've, Steve and I have known him for a while. He's a very inventor-friendly attorney. And I, I basically emailed him and I said, Jake, I just want to ask you a whole bunch of PPA questions to help our audience. And he said he was up for it. So because you guys have a lot of questions about provisional patent applications. You hear a lot of advice from Stephen and myself, but I thought it'd be nice to bring on a patent attorney so you could hear it straight from a patent attorney. So, um, Jake, let's just jump in. Um, this is the most common uh, question and worry that people have. And if my PPA runs out, if my provisional patent runs out, because it only gives me a year, do I lose all my rights? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, and we hear it all the time, right? And I think it's important to understand what a provisional patent application is, you know, when answering that question, right? Um, so it, it's it's really, it's a placeholder. It's a stepping stone in the process of obtaining a patent. And, and you're right, it gives you one year of patent pending status in which you can go out there and, and approach, you know, potential licensees, test the market, make your prototypes and all that. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the year, you have a decision to make whether or not you want to move forward with examination of your invention or not. And so a lot of times there's that question at the end of the year, um, you know, it, whether or not you can actually start that examination process. Maybe you haven't had the success that you thought you've had, or maybe you're still, you know, too deep into the development cycle uh, and not ready to move forward. And um, so there's sometimes the question about, well, what if I let my provisional application expire? Mm -hmm. And if you let your provisional application expire, you're basically giving up the benefit of that filing date one year earlier. That's the practical effect of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes there's the question, well, can I just refile my provisional application? And it's a nuanced question. You and I were talking a little bit before yeah. jumping on here about whether a refile is available. And the good lawyer answer is it depends. You know, it depends on whether or not you've committed certain other activities that might actually block the filing of a new application. Well, let's talk about that because I don't think they're too complicated. And I think for a large yeah. percentage of inventors, they didn't engage in activities that would prevent them from filing it again and get a new filing date. They Correct. Can't, they, which is another thing we should address. People think, can I continue it? And the answer is absolutely not. But you can file the exact same thing again under the right circumstances. That, that's right. You know, you, you cannot link provisional applications together like change. You know, they're, they're one and done. You file it and either you convert it and start the examination or you refile. And in which case, you're, you're right. You get, you're given a brand new filing date. Um, now, with, with provisional applications, the question about whether or not you have the option to refile then depends on a number of things. And it's what we call public disclosures or on-sale bars. Um, at least in the United States, if you publicly disclose your invention, offer it for sale, or actually sell the invention with, without having an application in process, a clock starts ticking. You have one year. And it's different from the one year with the provisional, you know, but you have one year from the committing of one of those activities, the public disclosure, the sale, or the offer for sale, in, in which to file your application or the invention effectively becomes public domain, meaning anybody can practice it. Um, so if you file your provisional, and then let's say you commence with public disclosures, putting on your websites, sales, and all that, that's normally fine, as long as you convert the provisional over and start the examination process. Uh, where where uh, this becomes an issue is then if you decide, well, I don't want to start examination yet, I want to refile. Well, then we have to look at the history. And at, at what point did you start these sales, these public disclosures? And if it was more than one year ago, you may actually not have an option of refiling, um, at least not on that basic basic invention. Um, but so, now, it, if if yeah. they if they haven't shown it to anybody, they made a prototype at their house. They haven't shown it to anybody. Didn't put it up on a website. Didn't sell it at a swap meet. They have every right to file that provisional again. They don't get the original date. But let's say file it today, which was like ten months, you know, after that. They get a year from this date if they file it again today. If they haven't it, put it up anywhere publicly disclosed, which is a lot of inventors, they get excited about the provisional. 
I, they file it, but I then they don't it, make take any action. I call, I call it the eureka moment. Yeah. Right? You know, the, the most natural tendency in the world for inventors to want to run down the street shouting eureka. You know, look what I made. And and we always tell inventors, you know, you need to be cautious about that. You need to be aware that it could affect your rights, you know, at, at some point in the future. But to answer your question, you're you're 100 percent correct. If if the inventor has really kept it under wraps, you know, maybe all, all disclosures with potential manufacturers and, and licensees have been under NDAs, which by the way, well, we can talk about NDAs, but that's actually the reason why NDAs are so important is they actually prevent a disclosure from being a public disclosure. Um, so if everything was done under wraps, under NDA, there haven't been sales, you didn't put it on your favorite social media platform for the world to see, then yeah, you may have the option of refiling. Uh, one thing I can, the comment I can make about refiling too is that's also generally an opportune time to make some edits and changes. Because typically, over the course of the year, you just weren't sitting on your hands. You were actually going out there, you were developing the concept, and you may actually have some improvements or changes. Mm -hmm. So very often, we'll ask that question. If we have determined that a refile is an option, you know, well, what else can we add to it? And because this is the opportune time to yeah. sort of further flesh out the invention in this new refiled application. So I didn't put this on the list of questions I was going to ask you, so I'm kind of uh, bum rushing you on this one. But um, with the Americans Event Act, I think that was 1993, I think. I, I forget when that was Mer signed. Americans Event Act, 2011. And, 2011, and I, sorry, and, I don't know. And it, went, and it went into full effect in 2013. Okay. I know these dates because they're burned into my mind. Yeah, because, that's, I had a seven-year... Two, and then I yeah. was just going back 17 instead of seven. <laughs> but, but okay, with the American Invent Act, um, does it state that privately showing your product for license, you email a sell sheet, a marketing piece to a potential licensee, no public disclosure, no website, no putting it up publicly on YouTube, it's all private, does not start that one year on bar rule from ticking and does not include as, it does not qualify as public disclosure. Yeah, the, the good lawyer answer is it depends, right? Okay. And and I can tell you that the the Americans in, America Invent Act, uh, the AIA we call it, um, you know, it didn't really change the the public disclosure rules uh, in, in in a very significant way. I mean, I teach patent law and patent practice at, at, at the law school level, and so we, we talk for days about about the public disclosure doctrine and on sale bar. And I can give you an example. There's actually a, a famous historical case that said there a, a publication um, of of a single book in one library collecting dust could be considered a an actual publication for, for prior art purposes as long as it was properly indexed and someone could find it. Um, and that one document is sufficient to be prior art. I generally would advise, uh, even where it's, it's a communication done by email, um, that there should at least be some sort of understanding of confidentiality hmm. between the parties. Preferably, you would actually get a non-disclosure agreement. In, in place. But, I mean, but that, as you that, know, that's, that's not it it's not practical from a business standpoint, from yeah. teaching people to license for the last 21 years. Filing your provisional patent should be your main protection to ask every company to sign your right. NDA. From a business standpoint, I'm not offering legal advice here. You're going to feel like you're beating your head up against a brick wall. You, so are you, you saying that as a secondary, not quite as good uh, method, is that you can put confidential in the email or on the sell sheet? Yeah, I think that's one way of papering yourself, right? But you no, know, this is my advice that I give because I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you don't want to scare off potential licensees, potential business partners by throwing a you know a, a thick non-disclosure agreement at them at the outset. To me, you know, you you think about it as layers of protection, and you start off with the PPA. You've lodged your invention with the patent office, and you have the comfort of knowing the invention is there. If someone files later, too bad, you're first in line. When you then approach the licensees, because you mentioned sell sheets, right? Mm -hmm. Very often, sell sheets don't get into the nitty gritty about what the invention is. You know, I, I think some of the best sell sheets, they, they present a problem, you know, and they present what you're doing as a solution. And a, a, a good sell sheet does not necessarily constitute a public disclosure of the invention. If you can't necessarily yeah, tell what the magic yeah, sauce is. Sometimes you don't know the inner workings of it, but yeah. a lot of times it's pretty obvious. It's a gardening yeah. trowel. It has a new thing on yeah. it and it's fully disclosed. Yep. 
Um, but it, that, that's why I said the good lawyer answer is, is it depends. I mean, if you can get by with a sell sheet to, to whet their appetite and they're saying, oh, now they're interested. Well, maybe once you get in the door, that's when you can always offer up an NDA to just try to cover yourself. But in the absence of that, because you're right, some companies won't even sign NDAs anyways. You know, that's just a blanket policy that they have. You still want to have some sort of comfort level that there's there that it's going to be recognized as a confidential disclosure, and you can do that through insertion of language in your emails, the um, the fact that you are patent pending with the provisional application. I think is also a, a great way, and probably should be the first step uh, before approaching any potential licensee, anyways, in order to show that you've actually fenced off something and you have the ability to lease that property in what we call a license. Mm. Um, so anyways, I, I mean, I think I think you're right. I always refer to it again as, as sort of those layers or, or levels of, of protection. PPA is great. Being pat pending is great. Having that confidential obligation on the other party is even better. Um, and, in, you know, and again, if you can't get that officially, well, at least try to create the written record that you consider this to be a confidential disclosure in case it, it's ever challenged. Mm hmm. Have you ever seen it be an issue? We've never seen it be an issue in the 21 years we've been doing it. Have you seen it? There's there's a lot of there's a lot of case law uh, going back a couple hundred years, <laughs> you oh. know, honestly on what on what public disclosures and offer for offers for sale are. Yeah. I, I can tell you, you know, it's not something that um, I would say to any inventor that you should you should be super scared about. I mean, we do a good job as as attorneys warning people about the law and being aware of it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're going to be successful in bringing your product to market, you have to trust someone, right? I think there's a, there's a good level of trust that has to be had between yourself and prospective licensees, manufacturers, et cetera. Um, you know, and one way of getting to that level of trust is through contract, but it doesn't have to be that done that way. Yeah. And, um, so, so what I would advise or counsel would be don't be so scared and don't tr hold it so tight to your chest that it doesn't get out there in the world. I mean, ultimately, the goal is to get it out there in the world and to be successful. But, but from a really technical standpoint, when you send your information to one person privately for, to potentially license it. Privately. Um, Privately is the issue. Yeah, private, but, but here's, you, yeah. here's your, what you're going to get at, I know that person could send it out and make it public, right? But if they didn't and they just received it, then it's not public, but they could show it around. It's not, not necessarily private either, you know, because a, a disclosure to a third party, even in a single individual, mm -hmm. can constitute a public disclosure underneath the right circumstances. So that's why, again, we advise if you're going to be making those, those disclosures, and in the absence of an NDA being in place, you should you Mark should it as confidential. do your best. Do your best. Mark it yeah. as confidential. Say I expect you know by receipt of this that you're going to be treating it you know as a confidential disclosure, um, so that if it ever does become an issue, which like you said, Andrew, that's probably rare that it will be an issue. But if it ever does, you can go back to your files and say, listen, this was not considered a public disclosure. Um, it was considered a private confidential disclosure as understood by the parties at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah, and you know, it, when you when you file a provisional and you later file a full utility, you're going to reference the provisional. In 21 years, we've never had a single student that ever had to use that year the provisional give gave them because the date was a debate, like ever. Yeah. Now, could yeah. it happen? Yes. Do you yeah. want to cover yourself? Yes. But it has never happened. So there's the things that uh, attorneys more talk about the things that could happen. And some yeah. attorneys, they don't give like, but it's extremely rare. They don't say that. They and then the yeah. inventor is like, gets a little too paranoid, you know. Well, that, and that's and that's what it, it's exactly what I was saying a moment ago, right? I mean, you, you know, we do I think maybe uh, too good of a job sometimes as lawyers <laughs> talking about the potential risks, right? And yeah. and that's why I make sure I counsel my clients, and I'm and I'm sure you do the same uh, through InventRight. But listen, there is this trust that you have to have. Um, ultimately, you can't hide it from the world if you also wanted to get get it out there and, and make it commercial. Uh, the two, those two sort of uh, thoughts are, are diametric. They don't, they're opposed. So, let, let's, so let's jump back to the beginning. Yeah. If I'm the inventor and I filed a PPA 12 months ago and it ran out, I hadn't shown it to anybody. Okay, maybe I showed it to my wife or, or kids or something, but I hadn't shown yeah. it to anybody. 
you have all the right to file a new provisional patent and not worry about public disclosure and get another year. Now, it doesn't continue that it, that prior provisional patent date. No. It starts a new date from the date you right. file it. So you lose that time and everybody's like, oh, but somebody could come up with something in that time. Yeah, they could. You can go out and spend 10 grand on a patent to try to upgrade it before the year runs out, or you can spend another 75 bucks and see if there's some interest. And let me and let me bring up a, another point. It's sort of it's sort of buried within what you were just saying. Um, someone could always file an application on the same invention in that intervening year. They could also file um, on that same or a similar invention up to 18 months, actually, past your initial filing date. And you would never know. That's the risk that all entrepreneurs have. Is there is an 18-month blackout period. Have you ever seen it happen? I haven't. Yeah. It, it, I, oh, you I, have? I have. It, but, but I would say it's, not, it's rare. You know, right. it, is, it is rare where that occurs. But it, what I'm, I would like to just sort of impress upon everyone watching this is, you know, it's just a risk of doing business. That's really all it is. Every single entrepreneur who's filing a patent application is assuming that same risk. You don't know what's been filed in the past 18 months because there is this blackout period under the law before an application is what's called published or laid open for the public to see. But it's so, also, it, and I want to invite you back and we'll do another show. I want to talk about the great <laughs> benefits of a provisional patent because they can't see what you have. And exactly. talk about that. But let's do that yes. on another show. I was going to say, we'll move, we'll move on. But I think you, you're exactly right. That publication and, and blackout period works both ways. It's an yeah, advantage. Yeah, it could be awesome really good. Say. It could be really yeah. good, too. So before we wrap up, I wanted to go right back to the very beginning. There's one year the provisional patent gives you, and then there's the one year on sale bar. And I know I have always have a heart because it's just a brain fart for people. You know, can you yeah. can you it's very it's hard to explain quickly. Can you quickly explain <laughs> the difference? Yeah, with provisional applications by law, in order to obtain the benefit of your earliest filing date, uh, which is the provisional, you have to file the regular non-provisional one year. And then the two documents get linked together like a chain. And when they start the examination of your regular non-provisional, you get the benefit of the filing date of your provisional year ago. Nothing in, that happened in that intervening year could be cited against you. It's a different one-year period for a public disclosure or sale. So let's say I go to a trade show and I'm publicly disclosing my invention, mm -hmm. all right? And I wait more than one year before filing my patent application. I could actually be barred from obtaining the patent because I committed this public yeah. disclosure. I showed my invention to the world more than one but year. But somebody would have to prove you made that public disclosure. Someone, someone would have to prove it. Um, or, you know, you know, I use the trade show as an example, Let, what, let's say I put it on my social media and social mm -hmm. media is for most platforms forever. Um, and a patent examiner, the patent examiners, um, not only do they look at prior patents and, and publications, but they also look at things like trade journals, you know, uh, scientific papers and the internet, and they may be able to find that sure. in, any, in any reasonable search and cite it against you. But let's, so, let's be honest. I mean, if you're a conservative, and most inventors are a little worried about having their ideas stolen, it would be the conservative way to go, especially since it's only 75 bucks if you're doing it yourself, to file a provisional patent before you make any public disclosure. We that always is, advise our students. That is our advice. That is what we strongly advise. Yeah. Because like you said, what are you out? Well, you're out 75 bucks, but you have the comfort of knowing that you've lodged the invention with the patent office. And you may not ever do anything with it, but you've preserved your rights. That's that's what you have done. And and that opens you up to go out there and do all those important licensing. Let, let me ask you this question. Let's say you file a provisional patent application. You wait. You, let's say you don't file a provisional and you publicly disclose it. You wait 10 months and then you file a provisional. Do you have a year from the time you file that provisional because you filed within a year of making public disclosure? Cor uh, correct. Correct. And that's perfectly fine. As long as so let's say you committed the public disclosure or sale within one year, you filed your provisional you've locked in a filing date. That is the filing date that any regular non-provisional filed a, less than a year later will obtain. And so um, because of that, when the examiner goes to pick it up and say, all right, what's the prior art? What happened prior to the earliest filing date? By law, your public disclosure cannot be considered prior art because it was less than one year prior to your Got it. Got it. But at InventRight, we always advise people to file a provisional before doing any public disclosure. And I think most attorneys do, don't they? That's, and that's, that's the smart 
option. That's that's exactly what we were just saying. We yeah. we strongly advise. I mean, it's great um, to have NDAs in place, uh, but you know the best option is you file the provisional application. You ha- now have the comfort of knowing it's with the patent office, and anybody who rushes there later, too bad. You right. you actually prevail because the U.S. is a first inventor to file country. Thank you so much, Jake. So I want to I want to no thank Jake for from Ward Law Offices, Jake Ward, for coming on and sharing that stuff about PPAs. I'm going to ask him back for another show. We're going to do more on PPAs because you guys have a lot of questions on PPAs, and we want to get them answered. And it's nice having an attorney on answering them. So thank you so much, Jake. I appreciate it. No problem, Andrew. Glad to help. All right, everybody, take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. See ya. Bye.